In this episode, we will undertake a feminist reading of Picnic at Hanging Rock. In part one, this will involve exploring what is involved in literary criticism and specifically feminist criticism. And in part two, we'll apply this knowledge to Joan Lindsay's novel, taken from the 2019 edition by the Text Publishing Company. Literary criticism can be defined in various ways. So we'll work through a number of steps before we attempt a concise definition. Let's start with the process of elimination. That is, by saying what literary criticism is not. And that will help to sharpen our focus on what it is. So let's be clear that literary criticism is not a summary of the plot, it's not a biography of the writer, and it's not an attempt at fault finding in a text or setting out to rate a text as inferior to another. Now, some elements of plot and a writer's biography may at times support literary criticism, but they are not the thing itself. The key concept for us is captured by the word interpretation. Now, it is also true that any opinion you express on a text constitutes an interpretation, whether it is reactive or well thought out. So there must be something distinctive about literary criticism that makes it a specific kind of interpretive approach. A very straightforward way of understanding a literary theory is to think of it as a lens which determines what we focus on in a text and what becomes less significant by consequence. You see this piece of red cellophane I'm holding. You may have come across a pair of novelty spectacles with cellophane for lenses. If I look through it, my perception of whatever I am trying to see is immediately altered. Everything is either in shades of red or negated to a dark colour. As a general rule, a colour filter will only allow light of its own colour to pass through. The cellophane recolours the available visual data, lessening the impact of some objects while prioritising others. I hope you're starting to see where I'm coming from with this comparison. In literary criticism, we put on our metaphorical spectacles, which allow us to focus more intently on a limited aspect or set of aspects in a text or across several texts, while diminishing our focus on those which by consequence become less important to us. Now, this approach of putting on our metaphorical spectacles involves a number of specific skills, which include comparison, analysis, interpretation and evaluation of the literary works on which we may focus. So, on the basis of specific evidence relating to a text, such as theme, style, setting or historical or political context, we form a coherent and insightful interpretation. Our insights may produce a positive or negative bias, but they cannot simply be an opinion based on what we like or dislike about a text. It's important for our purposes to think of the word opinion as significantly inferior to the word interpretation. Competent and serious students of literature always see their task as an interpretive one, which requires them to use the tools of analysis in a probing and intelligent way. To merely offer an opinion based on liking or disliking a text may be fine in conversation, but will never meet the demands of scholarly analysis. Literary criticism or critical theory is an ancient art which goes back, at least in its written form, to the philosopher Aristotle. Writing about writing has gone through many phases over the centuries, so the range of critical approaches is historically very wide. However, Contemporary schools of literary theory have tended to focus these diverse approaches and now influence how scholars look at and write about literature. The following timeline follows a rough chronological order, and we should also be aware that these schools sometimes overlap. Moral criticism, dramatic construction, 360 BC to the present, formalism, new criticism, Neo-Aristotelian criticism, 1930s to the present, psychoanalytic criticism, Jungian criticism, 1930s to the present, Marxist criticism, 1930s to the present, reader-response criticism, 1960s to the present, 
Structuralism Semiotics, 1920s to the present. Post-structuralism Deconstruction, 1966 to the present. New Historicism Cultural Studies, 1980s to the present. Post-colonial criticism, 1990s to the present. Feminist criticism, 1960s to the present. Gender queer studies, 1970s to the present. Critical race theory, 1970s to the present. Critical disability studies, 1990s to the present. Bearing in mind that no definition can ever do full justice to a concept as involved as literary criticism, let's now set down at least a working definition to help us focus our discussion. Literary criticism is the process of analysing and studying literature by means of a particular approach or combination of approaches, drawing on the various elements of a text or texts in order to produce a considered interpretation. In this episode, our focus will be on feminist criticism and its application to Picnic at Hanging Rock. Like many of the ism words in English, feminism is best understood in its plural form as feminisms. For our purposes, we need to develop a working understanding of feminism without covering all of its complexities or nuances. Still, it will help us if we are aware of the origins and development of this form of critical theory. Scholars often trace the evolution of feminism and feminist theory in terms of three waves. First wave feminism. From the late 1700s to the early 1900s, writers such as Mary Wollstonecraft, author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women, written in 1792, highlighted the inequalities between the sexes. The second wave of feminism, extending from the 1960s to the late 1970s, saw writers such as Simone de Beauvoir establish the groundwork for the dissemination of feminist theories in connection with the American civil rights movement and feminist political activism. In Australia, Picnic at Hanging Rock is understood to belong to this second wave of feminism. The third wave of feminism runs from the 1990s through to the present. Writers such as Alice Walker have promoted dialogue with and between communities marginalised by gender, sexual orientation and or cultural identity and heritage. Moreover, in an age when gender binaries have faced increasing scrutiny and in some quarters rejection, feminism has attempted to negotiate these sensitivities from the starting point of shared marginalisation. Now, although there have been these three waves of feminism, and although there are differences between and discrepancies in how feminist theory is applied, the following concerns generally emerge as central to feminist literary theory. 1. The belief that patriarchal ideology is the primary means by which women are oppressed economically, politically, socially and psychologically. 2. The designation of women by the patriarchy as other. Women are negatively defined by being that which men are not. As a consequence, they and their concerns are trivialised. 3. Western consciousness, empowered by the biblical portrayal of Eve as the origin of sin and death in the world, has consigned women to a place of inferiority. 4. Feminist theory and literary criticism, like all feminist activity, ultimately aim to change the world by promoting and achieving gender equality. 5. Gender is at the heart of all human activity and experience, including the production and analysis of literature, whether we are conscious of this or not. 6. While biology determines our sex as male or female, culture determines our gender using the categories of masculinity and femininity. Let's take this last point a little further, since it underpins so many of the others. When you are asked to indicate your gender on a form, the traditional choices are male or female, not masculine or feminine. So what we are dealing with here are two categories, the biological and the sociological. Masculinity and femininity are socially constructed, although some research has indicated a degree of biological influence, but we needn't be too caught up in this area of overlap. What this means then is that a character defined biologically as female can act with a masculine disposition and vice versa.
This helps us to avoid the very simplistic distinction which is sometimes found in weak or misguided feminist criticism. That is, that all men are bad and all women are good. The best writers show us that the dynamics at work between genders are complex and that a male character might well be used as a liberating force for women in the same way that a woman could be depicted as an ally of the patriarchy. In summary then, we understand feminist criticism to be a literary theory which deconstructs these various patriarchal assumptions in literature, takes them apart, exposes their underlying assumptions and holds them up for judgment and re-evaluation. Now, in part two, we will apply our knowledge of feminist theory to Joan Lindsay's Picnic at Hanging Rock. One of the best ways to apply a literary theory is to establish a set of key questions which target those issues at the core of the particular theory. We may not always need all of these and some of them do overlap, but here are some typical questions we would use to assist us in pursuing a feminist reading of a text. 1. How is the relationship between men and women depicted? Two. How are male and female roles defined? 3. What are the power relationships between characters in male or female roles? 4. What constitutes masculinity and femininity? 5. How do characters embody masculine and feminine traits? 6. Do any characters assume the behaviours or attitudes of the opposite gender? If so, what is the impact of this? 7. Which characters liberate others, which enslave others, and which operate in both zones? 8. What does the text reveal about the economic, political, social or psychological modus operandi of the patriarchy? 9. What does the text assert or imply about the potentialities of sisterhood in resisting patriarchy? 10. What does the text say about women's creativity? These questions are in no particular order and it isn't my intention to work through them systematically. However, the material we will cover from now through to the end of this episode will address all of these questions in some shape or form. So, in reading Picnic at Hanging Rock through a feminist lens, we can now apply these questions to the novel with a clearer understanding of the sort of information we are looking for. The world of Picnic at Hanging Rock, which is set in the year 1900, is very much an imported English one from the late Victorian era. The novel may be set in Australia, but the pervading attitudes are Anglo-Australian and stand in stark contrast to the geographical and meteorological realities of the environment. The Victorians thought of the two sexes as inhabiting what they called separate spheres sharing only breakfast and dinner times in an average day. This ideology was derived from what were understood to be the natural characteristics of men and women. Women were considered physically weaker, yet morally superior to men. These qualities made them best suited to the domestic sphere. In fact, the belief that women were so influential at home was used as an argument against giving them the vote. As the 19th century progressed, Men began to commute more and more to their places of work in the factories, shops or offices. Wives, daughters and sisters were left at home all day to ensure that domestic duties were attended to. This domestic role influenced the way in which women were educated. Since it was not expected that men would be attracted to a girl because of her domestic skills, it became necessary for her to acquire what were known as accomplishments. These included a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, literature and modern languages. As far as deportment was concerned, the Victorian girl had to acquire a certain grace in her manner of walking, a gentle tone of voice and exquisite manners. It's not difficult to see how congenial a home this paradigm finds in Picnic at Hanging Rock, especially through the agency of Mrs Appleyard who is its embodiment par excellence. To develop their aesthetic side, the girls attend Mrs. Valange's art class, and early on we learn that the college was already, despite its brief existence, quite famed for its discipline, deportment and mastery of English literature. 
learn on page 10 that Mademoiselle de Poitiers teaches dancing and French conversation and attends to the boarder's wardrobes. The gender hegemonies of the period are sharply though narrowly defined. The word hegemony, by the way, means a dominant cultural influence over others. Some pronounce it hegemony. In this period, excessive study was thought to be detrimental to the delicate health of women. Some doctors claimed that too much study could damage the ovaries. When we reached the period in which the novel is set, Oxford and Cambridge were finally accepting female students, but many families refused to allow their clever daughters to attend for fear that they would make themselves unmarriable. A woman should not appear too eager when seeking a husband, as this could reveal an excessive sexual appetite. The only valid reason a woman should desire marriage in this period was in order to become a mother. Typically, girls married in their early to mid-twenties, usually to a man about five years older. Now, it's important to note that while Lindsay allows for the recreation of certain aspects of this late Victorian gender hegemony, her main purpose, certainly from a feminist perspective, is to subvert it. And she achieves this subversion in a number of ways. Let's take a simple example to begin with. We have discussed the educational model of late Victorian England as it applied to young women. There was, however, a social movement against this, of which Greta McCraw is a prominent example. The so-called Blue Stocking Society originated in the 18th century, but its influence lingered well into the 19th century. These were women who devoted themselves to intellectual pursuits. They were widely regarded as unfeminine and off-putting because of their attempts to usurp the intellectual superiority of men. Even the girls in the novel react to the intellectual asexuality of Miss McCraw, especially on the basis of her dress. The boarders, used to her outlandish wardrobe, were no longer amused, and her choice for today's picnic went without comment. The well-known church-going toque and black-laced boots, together with the puce-coloured police, in which her bony frame took on the proportions of one of her own Euclidean triangles, and a pair of rather shabby puce kid gloves. McCraw's intellectual and rational faculties are shown to be of value, not just for their educational relevance, but also for their usefulness to Mrs. Appleyard in her role as leader of the college which bears her name. The headmistress herself is very aware of this fact, and late in the novel acknowledges her dependence on Greta McCraw. It was inconceivable that this woman of masculine intellect, on whom she had come to rely in the last years, should have allowed herself to be spirited away, lost, raped, murdered in cold blood like an innocent schoolgirl on the hanging rock. Whatever her eccentricities, and Lindsay does use her satirically at times, Miss McCraw is very much her own woman atypical, independent, free from the control of any man, and able to pursue her interests as she pleases. The fact that she is, in the words of Mrs. Appleyard, spirited away, is especially significant in the novel's feminist architecture. But we will leave this point for further consideration shortly in our discussion of the spiritualizing of the selected few. Although as a group the girls react strongly to Miss McCraw, they are also like her in a number of ways, ways that are sometimes obvious and at other times more subtle or implied. Marion Quaid, Miss McCraw's star pupil, clearly shares her passion for mathematics. Reputed to have mastered long division in the cradle, Marion Quaid had spent the greater part of her 17 years in the relentless pursuit of knowledge. Small wonder that with her thin, intelligent features, sensitive nose that appeared to be always on the scent of something long awaited and sought, and thin swift legs, she had come to resemble a greyhound. Like Greta McCraw, the girls share a cloistered world from which the direct influence of men has been removed, and in which their minds enjoy a high degree of freedom and empowerment at the level of the personal, social and intellectual. The girls are amused by the fact that Irish Tom has sent Miss McCraw a Valentine's card on, quote, squared paper covered with little sums, unquote.
Lindsay uses this, however, to underline the idiosyncratic and independent nature of McCraw's personality by adding in the narration that the 45-year-old purveyor of higher mathematics to the senior girls had received it with dry approval, figures in the eyes of Greta McCraw being a good deal more acceptable than roses and forget-me-nots. The very sight of a sheet of paper dotted over with numerals gave her a secret joy, a sense of power, knowing how with a stroke or two of a pencil they could be sorted out, divided, multiplied, rearranged to miraculous new conclusions. Tom's valentine, though he never knew it, was a success. The sequestered and privileged world which the girls and their female teachers and tutors inhabit can be referred to as a homosocial microcosm. Let's look at this word homosocial for a moment and line it up against similar sounding words in order to clarify meanings and avoid confusion. Homosocial means pertaining to social interaction between members of the same sex. Homosexual means being sexually attracted to people of one's own sex. And homoerotic means relating to homosexual love. There are, of course, relationships among the girls which could be regarded as lesbian, encompassing the two concepts of homosexuality and homoeroticism. This aspect of the novel doesn't seem, however, to be one of Lindsay's principal concerns. The girls are at a significant stage in their psychosexual development, and their relationships are naturally intense, emotional, and in some cases, experimental. It is more the homosocial dimension of the college that preoccupies Lindsay, and in which she is able to situate her most compelling pro-feminist agenda. Heterosexual people often belong to homosocial environments such as single-sex schools, sporting clubs, or simply a select group of friends for whom they feel no sexual attraction, but strong bonds of friendship. Such is the world of Appleyard College, which it has to be admitted, also witnesses rivalries, petty jealousies and power struggles. That is the reality of any human social grouping. And yet, this homosocial environment still provides a strong sense of sisterhood and corporate solidarity, which Lindsay proposes as an alternative to the male-dominated outside world. Lindsay's exploitation of this boarding school environment allows her to achieve a number of aims. Foremost amongst these is the establishment of a microcosm where women come first and men are decidedly less important. In so doing, the author creates a liminal space for the women in her novel who, separated from mainstream society, participate in, manage and control their own world with powers which they would have far less access to in the patriarchal world beyond their gates. At the same time, and because many of the constraints applied by the external world are still able to penetrate their own, the girls require a supernatural force to help them transcend the most limiting of these constraints. Clearly, it is the rock which thus empowers them. Let's look at this relationship diagrammatically. Starting from the bottom and moving up, we see that the outer patriarchal society surrounds women and subjugates them to the power of men. In the middle, we see that at Appleyard College, the influence of patriarchal society is present, but women come first and so there is an overlap. At the top is the rock, whose feminine power eclipses the power of the patriarchy and draws women back to their primal uniqueness. One key way in which Lindsay highlights the influence of the patriarchal world of the late Victorian era is in her description of the clothes the girls wear. Insulated from natural contacts with earth, air and sunlight, by corsets pressing on the solar plexus, by voluminous petticoats, cotton stockings and kid boots, the drowsy well-fed girls lounging in the shade were no more a part of their environment than figures in a photograph album arbitrarily posed against a backcloth of cork rocks and cardboard trees. We also see in this passage the separation of the girls from the authenticity of the elemental world. The solar plexus, a complex network of nerves located behind the navel, traditionally symbolizes energy, intellect 
and the relationship a person has with fire and the sun. These potentialities are all negated by the constraints of the girl's clothing and by the social conditioning which dictates the way they are made to dress. Notice that Lindsay begins a subtle process of undoing these constraints when the girls remove their gloves before arriving at the rock. Then, as the four girls ascend the rock, all except Edith remove their shoes and stockings, a symbolic renunciation of the exigencies of civilization and a movement towards embracing the natural world. When Irma is found, it is without her corset. The very act of exploration, traditionally a male prerogative and one which customarily enhances the heroic nature of masculine achievement, is appropriated by women in a new and metaphysical way. The patriarchal psyche sees that which it sets out to conquer as the enemy, projecting onto it, at a psychological level, a fear of an unknown that is and which therefore must be overcome. This demonizing attitude is very much at the heart of the approach of the early colonists in Australia and their so-called taming of the land. By contrast, the final ascent which the three girls make of the rock occurs in a radically different ontological space. Of the 20 schoolgirls, it is a subgroup who become the focus of the narrative and who are used by Lindsay to expand her feminist agenda. Notice that of the four who ascend the rock, three have first names that begin with the same four letters, although in varying orders. Miranda, M-I-R-A, Marion, M-A-R-I, and Irma, I-R-M-A. For Irma, there are no other letters apart from these four. Her human form is her complete self, and so she is eventually rejected by the rock, and unlike her other two companions, is not sanctified. Edith, who makes the ascent with the other three girls, bears a name which disassociates her from them and makes her as having been, and marks her as having been immediately rejected by the rock. She, of course, is the one who runs screaming back to the picnic group at the moment when her companion's spiritual ascent commences. Of all the girls, it is Miranda who is emblematized as the chosen one. A Latin word, her name translates as she who is to be wondered at, or as miracle. Like Miranda in Shakespeare's The Tempest, Lindsay's Miranda attracts the love and admiration of those who come into contact with her. On page 8 we are told that, quote, Miranda as usual had a drawer of her wardrobe filled with lace-trimmed pledges of affection, unquote. At the same time, she seems in her own right to be one who loves unselfishly and generously. On page 9 she is described as, quote, ever charitable, unquote. Irma later describes her as, quote, beautiful and kind, unquote. In episode one, we looked at the phenomenon of the Miranda Swan, with its qualities of transcendent beauty and gracefulness, reflections of the Miranda we knew before her disappearance on the rock. Notice, too, that Miranda is not given a surname. Her first name is sufficient to encapsulate the entirety of the wonder that she is. While Lindsay does choose to describe Miranda in sexual terms, the girl's emerging sexuality is neither directed towards nor responsive to the advances of men. In this way, Miranda becomes an agent in reinforcing the centrality of women to this world of awakenings and new potentialities, while being free from the expectations and domination of men. For Lindsay, Miranda's femininity bespeaks a new kind of strength. She is a potent force in the world, but her potency does not stem from the same sources as the potency of the patriarchy. She is a leader because it is she who most readily yields to the lure of the rock where the true self is to be found. In her there is a balancing of opposites. The same girl who moves gracefully is also the same girl who, at the age of five, quote, threw a leg over a horse like a boundary rider, unquote. She is both spirit and flesh. Her intuition tells her that, quote, she won't be here much longer, unquote, and that, quote, everything begins and ends at exactly the right time and place, unquote. Men begin to look like followers in light of the leadership of young women like Miranda. In this way, Lindsay argues that the new order in Australia will be forged by women as the leaders, with men relegated to following their example. 
Michael Fitzhubert, whose role in this world of women we shall examine shortly, is the epitome of a follower, and even the coachman, Albert Crundall, is one whose service to the Fitzhuberts is also a kind of following. Miranda's vanishing on the rock amounts to a successful rite of passage into the natural world. She enters a space that is millions of years old, a locus of eternity and place of timelessness. Miranda thereby relinquishes the artificialities of so-called civilization. Here there is beauty, truth, harmony, completeness, all of which have been corrupted elsewhere by the inauthenticity of the patriarch. The integrity of nature can the masculinized world of white Australia build a meaningful relationship with the land. In allowing themselves to be sacrificed to the rock on behalf of others, the women are physically transformed into the landscape itself. A landscape may be understood as female, embodying all that is sacred and most truthful, and all that is most fruitful and most creative. It is out of the land that life itself is born. In the biblical book of Genesis, God forms Adam from the dust of the earth. In Picnic at Hanging Rock, Lindsay implies that the ancient rock is a beginning place, out of which life is hatched in an eternal cosmogonic cycle. Notice how Miranda first perceives the rock. Miranda was the first to see the monolith rising up ahead, a single outcrop of pockmarked stone, something like a monstrous egg perched above a precipitous drop to the plain. The egg, a symbol of female fecundity, is about to drop and open up the new life within it, and it is Miranda who is first to see it. The young woman's attentiveness early in the novel to the rock's female identity signals her suitability for subsequent communion with it. To return for a moment to Greta McCraw, notice how she too, like the young schoolgirls, is given full access to union with the rock. For its own mysterious reasons, the rock calls to itself an apparently unlikely character. On the other hand, Miss McCraw is one who, although a rational and obsessive person, has shown courage and independence in pursuing an intellectual path, contrary to society's expectations of her. She is clearly her own person, but she still lacks what the rock can give her through its transformative powers. In opposition to the principle of feminine integrity and female fecundity which the rock embodies, Lindsay provides us with the formidable persona of Mrs. Arthur Appleyard, her full name suggesting yet again that a woman's identity is relative to that of her husband. Mrs. Appleyard is a pertinent example of a point I made earlier in this episode, that good feminist writers don't necessarily regard all women in their texts as admirable. The robust and imposing headmistress is, in many ways, a masculinized figure who has readily assumed many of the authoritarian and materialistic attitudes of the patriarchy. She has willingly conceded to the expectations placed upon her by the parents of her pupils, who in turn perpetuate a patriarchal model of education as a mode of social control. On page 8 we read, with her high-piled greying pompadour and ample bosom, as rigidly controlled and disciplined as her private ambitions, the cameo portrait of her late husband flat on her respectable chest, the stately stranger looked precisely what the parents expected of an English headmistress. Mrs. Appleyard's attempts at controlling and regulating the lives of her pupils amount to a suppression of the girl's feminine potential for individuality and creativity. As an enforcer and propagator of economic and social exigencies, she is devoid of any aesthetic or cultural sensitivities beyond those which enforce power and control. Her attitude to the gardens at Appleyard College exemplifies this. Well-kept beds and lawns were no more than a symbol of prestige. Neatness was all and a continuous array of showy blooms to be admired beyond the stone walls by passers-by on the high road. 
Lindsay employs a very physical vocabulary in relation to Mrs. Appleyard, even using an industrialized image when, late in the novel, Minna refers to her employer as, quote, Ultimately, breathing like Lindsay a steam engine, allows Mrs. Appleyard unquote. to destroy herself, thereby representing the death of the false values and attitudes which this singularly dictatorial and intransigent character has consistently espoused and enacted on behalf of a patriarchy to which she has willingly sold herself. The men in the novel, nearly all of whom are minor characters, generally occupy and perform traditional roles, such as doctors, coachmen, police and gardeners. The professionals and semi-professionals among them possess civic and social power. The external world of control, change and achievement belongs to them. Entrenched in the prevailing gender paradigm, they are of limited interest to Lindsay as vehicles for advancing her feminist agenda other than to confirm the gender hegemony of the times. The one significant exception is Michael Fitzhubert, nephew of Colonel and Mrs Fitzhubert. On the one hand, Michael is the epitome of the privileged patriarchal aristocrat, living a dilettante lifestyle, having been brought up in conformity with the strict romantic conventions of his class and historical period. On the other hand, Lindsay gives him special access to the world of the girls, as well as making him highly responsive both to the swan maiden Miranda and to the supernatural rock itself. In various ways, he is disempowered as a masculine agent of patriarchy, but re-empowered as a seeker of feminine metaphysical truth. As a newly arrived British colonist, Michael is able to gain a certain degree of access to the rock, but because he is tainted by the stain of imperialism, the rock will not allow him to be subsumed into its ultimate mysteries. The Miranda Swan becomes his closest connection point with the fullness of encounter with the rock, which has chosen to give access only to an elite few. As we conclude, I will make a final point about literary criticism. No one perspective on a text will tell you all you want to know about it. In fact, the great works of literature are great in one sense because they resist any form of ultimate interpretation, while at the same time leaving themselves open to new insights and fresh interpretations. In episode one, we entered the text through the analysis of one of its key motifs, the swan, and this provided an angle on the Michael Miranda relationship in particular. In episode two, we looked at the rock as an active metaphysical presence in the novel, and in episode three, we examined the novel through the lens of Gothic fiction. In this episode, we have seen the rock in a different light, as a female presence which, rather than meddling in lives, calls them to transcendent fullness. Remember that more than one interpretation of a text can be valid, provided it is based soundly on the evidence supplied by the text itself. All of these considerations reinforce for us how endlessly absorbing and engaging the study of literature can be.